Welcome to the Millerville Community Church podcast of our Sunday morning sermon series, where the Word of God is always the focus of our hearts and prayers. MCC is a non-denominational country-style church, just a short 20-minute drive from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Although we're often considered a cowboy church, we're actually a community of diverse people from many different backgrounds who have a common commitment to our Lord Jesus Christ and the Word of God. This live recording is made possible by the generous donation and support of our subscribers. If you would like to join the growing community of seekers and believers who support MCC podcasts, just go to our website, www.millervillechurch.org, and you can make your online donation anytime. If you have questions, suggestions, and feedback you would like to share with us, please use our email service at infomillervillechurch.org. The following podcast is available on SoundCloud, Millerville Church, and subscribe to us on iTunes under Podcasts. Look for Religion and Spirituality and Millerville Community Church. And now, here is a message from Sunday Morning at MCC. We're continuing our sermon uh, series in the book of Corinthians. We're up to chapter 6, halfway down. We're going to be starting at chapter 12. And uh, we've been learning a lot about uh, the kingdom of God and what he would have us learn and do. Um, Sandra got her exercise in this morning. I forgot and didn't have time. So would you excuse me while I do this? i got to get my exercises in. <laughs> We've been uh, trying to get healthy. Uh, Sandra and I have been, uh, went through a health scare, as some of you know. Oh! <laughs> and uh, so we were eating better. We we're trying to get our weight down, to exercise our muscles, and uh, we've been trying all kinds of methods. This one is a method that we're starting to do and you know, trying to do it on a regular basis, but we don't always get there. I'm so proud to say that I'm exercising now and working out in such marvelous ways. I've got a ways to go, and uh, this is good exercise. I'm going to ask Nathan Welsh to come up here. <laughs> Nathan Welsh, come on up here. I'm, I'm very proud of my exercise program, but uh, come up here, Nathan. I think you'll see it. Look at my physique, and then... <laughs> Make a muscle. Look at that. So someday, I'm going to look like this guy physically. I'll just keep it. I told him I was using resistance training, and he said, well, that's fantastic. You know, it's really good, but I'm at yellow. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. You're a good man. Thank you, Nathan. <laughs> this is like yellow belt. It's nothing at all. You can go up to black, green, blue, and go all the way up in resistance training. But I'm just at yellow. I am just started out, and uh, it's hard. Sandra and I are also trying to walk on a regular basis. We're out in our neighborhood, even in freezing weather, and we're walking, and we're feeling good and pumped everything else. And then I was talking to David Proctor last week. Oh, yes. Marathon distant runner, and, you know, the smirk on his face is just... And I, I've been doing periodic fasting, and I found out a few of you are doing that as well, and up, up to 16 hours fasting, and really that includes sleep time, you know, in between. And then I, I talk to others of you, you're up to 18. I've got a good friend in Sweden, he's doing days and days of it, and it's almost embarrassing. Have you ever done that, where you start out to do something, and then you think you're doing really good, and then you run into someone else, and when you compare yourself to them, it's like, oh, why even bother, right? I'll never, I'll never get to that level. It's what I call the uh, coaster comparison collision. <laughs> so when you start, it's a roller coaster ride. You're feeling really good, and then you're way down. And so I just recommend keeping overweight and flappy and sick people around you all the time, and then you're going to look really great as you try to improve your life. I don't think we can blame if we feel a little frustrated from time to time by the whole confusion about how we feel about our bodies. And uh, 
there are some days you feel great about your bodies and there are some days you absolutely hate your bodies that you're in. Those among us who work at the hardest have found this bizarre truth. Those that work at, us, work at the hardest at being healthy and strong are usually the ones that have the most issues with their body. Because you see all the things that you wish could be that aren't. It's those of us like me who have given up that it really doesn't matter anymore and we don't feel bad about it at all. So today I want to share with you from God's holy word, from the passage we're going to be looking today, about the Bible says about our bodies and our love-hate relationship with them, which we all do. We have a love-hate relationship with our bodies. And by the end of this message, I hope that what you get from the Word of God this morning is that you can have a different kind of a relationship with your body that is not a love-hate relationship. We're not uh, going to follow the latest diets or exercise programs today. We're not plugging anything, and you can't purchase anything after the service. But we're going to talk about relationships and purpose for which our bodies were created by God. We're also going to discover... What a difference being born again, receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior can make to your body that is dwelled in by the Holy Spirit. It's a transformation that is instantaneous and eternal for your body. This message comes from God's Word and it could change your life this morning. It could save your life. It could even transform your life in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You want to know more? Sounds good? All right. Let's uh, go into the Bible, and we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, where we begin, and we're going to go through to verse 14. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and stomach is for the food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immortality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now, God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Praise be to God and to his word. Paul is uh, writing to the church in Corinth. It's full of Greeks. And uh, Greeks had a lot of different ideas. And uh, because you belong to a Western society, a lot of you think like Greeks. So you and the Corinthians have a lot in common. So you don't think like Jewish people or Hebrew people. You think like rational, well, semi-rational Greeks. And the Greeks had slogans and philosophies. And in this passage, you might think uh, Paul is making the statements, but he's actually quoting slogans from the Greeks. Did you know that? So when he gets to that section, he says, I have a right to do anything. I can do anything I want. And then he follows it up with a corrective statement that says uh, something about that. But also the slogan that goes this way, food for the stomach and stomach for the food. So that's a great justification to say if you're thinking that way, if, if it's in front of you, you should eat it. <laughs> you should deny yourselves nothing. There is a group of thinkers in the hedon hedonistic, Hellenistic world that held to the idea that uh, pleasure is the highest good. And these uh, people, uh, in their thinking, were called hedonists. And they believed that ultimate pleasure, uh, giving pleasure and not doing harm to your body, was the ultimate good. And so uh, the Romans adopted this later on. It was a very popular idea. Yes, pleasure is what it's all about. Have a good time. And uh, believe it or not, that did not originate in America or Canada or the Brits. That began with the Greeks long ago, long before the Romans took it up. And they, uh, I, I used to be a studier of uh, philosophy. Any of you know philosophy? 
And philosophy and its study, the way we know it, begins with the Greeks. And what they would do, have symposiums. You ever hear of a symposium? It's where a bunch of philosophers get together and share their ideas. But the hedonists in the group, when they did that, thought they should get drunk on beer before they do all that. And they would just get absolutely sauced and then share their philosophies because everyone sounds smarter when you're drunk, right? And that's what a symposium is, an increased attendance as well to these events, as you can well imagine. Yeah! <laughs> she has a sense of humor. I like that. So the Greeks had this idea of hedonism, that uh, you should, should just enjoy life. Is there anyone in our society who thinks that's what it's all about? Food for the stomach and stomach for the food. If it feels good, do it. Whatever feels good. That's a hedonistic philosophy. Now, is there any problem with that way of thinking? Paul says here there is a problem with that. And the problem is, is that he's talking to people who got saved, received the Lord Jesus Christ, but they had this history in the Greek culture and they're bringing it into their lifestyle, into the church, and they haven't exactly saved, uh, changed everything. All things are lawful for me. They... They read the gospel, I'm forgiven, everything's forgiven, I'm under the cross, and I'm under the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm under grace, and uh, if I sin, it's forgiven, and it's under the grace, I can do whatever I want. No restrictions, there's no punishment, I can just, all things are lawful for me. I'm not, Paul said, I'm not under the law anymore, there's no more rules upon me, I can do whatever I want. Did you grow up with rules in the church? I grew up with, uh, in the Church of God and that we had the rules about uh, you could play games but nothing with face cards. So Rook became really famous because there wasn't face cards on it. We could, uh, uh, there was no drinking, there was no dancing, and there was no pool, but you could do other things, but you couldn't do those things. Even in some of our extreme cases, they said you couldn't go to movie houses either because strange things happened there. And we grew up with these rules. And, and then we read a section in Paul that says, all the rules are out. You're free from religion. You don't have to follow the rules. You can do whatever you want. You're under grace. You've been set free from the laws and the rules. And the hedonists in the group took that very seriously. They started doing everything and uh, with no restriction. And Paul says, no, I think you've gotten it wrong as you've looked at it. He says, not all things are profitable. Although you are free in Christ, not everything is to your benefit. And I've learned that if I polish off a Costco level cream puff carton, that is not good for me. I've learned that the hard way. Yes, she's with me today. She's laughing with me. And if I've learned uh, as my body changes, there are things my body now repels at that it didn't used to like, that it used to love, and now it doesn't like at all. So we learn that not all things are profitable. Some of you are learning the hard way. And you're probably saying with exercise and so on, you say, I have tried exercise, it hurt me, so I'm not doing it anymore. It is not profitable. But even if something hurts you, it doesn't mean it's not profitable. So he's arguing what profits you in uh, both in pleasure and in discipline of your body. The other slogan, which is food for the stomach and stomach for, uh, for food, uh, Paul counters it and says, but I will not be mastered by anything. And that's the problem. If you just follow the urges of your body and eat whatever you want or do whatever it wants to do, you will be mastered by your body. It will get away on you and you will no longer be in control of it. So what is the options to this hedonistic lifestyle that is laid out before us? The Word of God reminds us that no matter how much pleasure you can get out of life or how great the party that you might be at, you are dying in your soul inside more and more every day. One day the body we pamper and give everything it wants is going to die and the party is over as soon as our body is dead. And on our deathbed and on bad days when our soul feels the deep, dark depression of despair, we'll ask, is this all there is? That's what a hedonist will ask. My friend, there is so much more to life than a bag of chips. All that in a bag of chips, right? 
there's so much more to life than a bag of chips. There's more to it than the comfort of sexual pleasure. There's the idea of serving our body's needs is the end goal of life, but we're trying to get beyond that idea. It is a short-sighted idea, and it's short-lived as well. The body was not meant to be served, but to give service to something greater and more beneficial than itself. Our bodies, believe it or not, are meant to serve Jesus Christ. It is to be a house of the Holy Spirit and to experience the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit working through it in service to others. The purpose is built into the design and the complexity of your body. Your body was made for this. Our bodies were never feel right until they were being used by Jesus Christ in service to the glory of God. Did you know that? That's what your bodies are made for? You're not being told that in the media. You're not being told that at schools or universities. Uh, you go to your medical doctor. You ask him, did, Doc, did you know my body was made for the service of Jesus Christ? And you're like, no, I didn't know that. They don't even know that. But the Word of God says that's what your body was made for. Our bodies are meant to serve the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're going to pick it all up at 15 as we go through this. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never! Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Now, yes, I said the word prostitute because it's in the Word of God. This is a PG sermon. Um, a lot of you are encouraging our children to read the Word of God, and that's fantastic. But I want you to know there is risque stuff in here. It talks about hell and judgment. It talks about prostitutes and sexual immorality and everything else. And so it should because it deals with the reality of our life and how to overcome the great dangers that are in it. We don't know this great reality of Jesus using us and our bodies for his glory, and we need to discover that we are divinely created by God because we're just too uh, busy using our bodies for baser things. This is not unlike uh, you going out and buying a luxury car. By the way, I just want to, what do you consider a luxury car? Yell out what you think model that is. What is a luxury car to you? A Ferrari? What? A Tesla? You want a Tesla? A Ferrari? A Tesla? No Porsches? Okay. <laughs> if you went out and bought a car like that, and then you used it to transport pig from the farm to the slaughterhouse. That's the way we use our bodies. The, the, our bodies are specifically and created by God for his glory, for his purposes, to accomplish what he wants to, do, to accomplish through your bodies. But we treat them like we're transporting pigs to the slaughterhouse. You would never do that with a luxury car. Why would you do that with your bodies? It makes absolutely no sense. I'm no longer just talking about diet and exercise, of course, or the lack thereof, or whatever. I'm also talking about things we do in the dark, in the private, that we would not tell anyone else about, especially in the church. Of all the things we could do with our bodies, there's probably no greater misuse of the divine creation that your body is then our crazy sexualization of our bodies. I will not talk about all the ways we can chase perversions and sin into the abyss of uh, self-indulgence, because that's many. Instead, I will argue with the root idea that we have come to believe that our bodies are in charge. And whatever the body wants, the body gets. Food for the stomach and stomach for the food. And that we must do what our bodies tell us to do, no matter how perverse or how wicked those actions are in the eyes of God. We let the pigs drive our luxury cars into the ditch. 
We have people today that are telling us that our body knows best and we should do whatever the body wants. If it feels good, do it. If you think about it, that makes absolutely no sense at all. People who live like that become addicted. They die early deaths. And in their wake of hedonistic pleasure, they leave wrecked lives while killing their own soul of any meaning or purpose greater than a narcissistic love. All of us, no matter who we are, we're meant for more than that. Everyone thinks it's not too late to try to experience some pleasure in this life, maybe with one more bag of chips, one more sexual encounter, because that is what demons are whispering in our ears all the time. Today, though, the Holy Spirit is shouting. He's trying to tell you it's not too late to unite your body with the Lord Jesus Christ through your spirit. Many of us, not all of us here this morning, have made the first step and we've repented of our sins and we have asked the Lord Jesus Christ into our hearts to forgive our sins, to wash us clean, and to have his Holy Spirit come into our spirit so we can be born again. Many friends... My friends, that this is a good and essential start to be born again. But I want you to know in an exercise program with the Lord Jesus Christ, that's yellow level tension. That's just the start of exercising and disciplining your body for the Lord Jesus Christ. We've only begun after we've asked Jesus into our hearts. And we have started towards an experience with Jesus Christ, transforming us from the inside out. What salvation brings is an opportunity to make a change in our life, and it's the next step of leaving our old ways behind that we used to have. As Paul encouraged the hedonists to leave their old ways behind, and the way they used to think about their bodies, and the way they have lived before. We need to step into a new way of believing, and acting as if we're going to know what our bodies were created for, to reveal the glory of God to others through our bodies. 1 Corinthians goes into this, chapter 6, and we're going to 18 now, where Paul talks about this purpose. He says in verse 18, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. And do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Sexual immorality in all its forms should not be your focus. Anytime we put indulging our sexuality first in our lives, for any reason, we are acting immorally. We will hurt others and we'll hurt ourselves. Our bodies were not meant for self-indulgence and to make us feel better. We want to get away from anyone who invites us to live a self-gratifying life that focuses on what our body wants and it desires. Paul says, flee the sexual immorality. To get away from it, you will wreck a glorious creation of God if that becomes your focus, using it for base purposes he never intended you to use it for. We run away from sin and away from the desires of the body into the arms of Jesus Christ. He receives us, he holds us, he forgives us, And he asks us to begin again. And through Jesus Christ, we get a chance to realize something far more amazing than self-indulgence. When we surrender our bodies to Jesus Christ and in his direct service, then we step into the realms of miracles, wonders, and of supernatural events. Our bodies become something greater than itself a physical vessel that holds a holy presence with a power to transform worlds. We become a temple of God. I'll give you two quick illustrations to this point because some won't believe me that this is true. 
One is the beginning of the Alcoholics Anonymous movement, a group of uh, Christians who had uh, alcoholic problems got together in a group, and as they battled through it, they gave birth to what we call this 10-step program. Those original Christians, if you read the original stuff, uh, came to the conclusion that you need to be honest and go through the point of uh, reality, accepting that your bodies are out of control and that you're an alcoholic, and then they would say, and then you need to confess that to a group. And all of that's very biblical. If you think about that, if you confess your sins one unto another, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive. And then in the original group, they said, and then you need to accept that there is a God. They didn't say a higher power at the beginning. They said there is a God and that you need God's help to overcome your addiction. And when you recognize that and then you seek reconciliation with others, you receive, you need God's strength greater than yourself. That founding idea of AA has spread over a 10 point programs all over the world and has become one of the most effective ways to overcome addiction. But now if you water down the God section in the confession, it doesn't work. You've got to have that. But you can be more than the demands of your body. And A has proven that 100,000 times over and over and over again. It still works to this very day. If you begin with these very basic, what began as biblical principles within AA program. My own son, uh, when he worked uh, for the United States Air Force, he was going into a SEER program. And uh, before they entered, uh, accepted in his program, he had to go through a testing. And in this testing, they uh, purposely take the candidates that are going into this program, and they wanted to know the strength of the person's will. And they wanted to know, what do you do when your body fails? If your body just says, I'm not going one more step, I'm done. What is your attitude? What do you do? So what they do is they take these fit airmen, and they run them through the program, and they break them. They take them to the point where their bodies literally fail, and then they step back and watch. And only those that keep going when the body says no get into the program. It's a survivalist program. My son, uh, we prayed him all the way through that. We were really concerned about what he was going to exercise and get ready for it. And his advisor says, stop exercising. You're just delaying the inedible. We've got to break you, so the less fit you are, the sooner we can get you to that point. I would break real easy. I can't believe I have a son like this that's so fit. Anyways, he, he got through the program. He had the strength of will. And after he graduated with his degree in survivalism, he then learned the great truth. He said, most of the people that survived that program, if not the majority, are Christians. Because when they come to the end of who they are, of what their body can do, they go beyond it into the strength of God. You are more than your body. There are miracles on the other side of that. Wonders take you places you thought you could never go. When you realize your body isn't for you, it's for Christ to work through, to do amazing things. I have so many stories that talk about how Christ can move through you in ways that you don't even understand. You might not even be aware that it's happening, but he can use you in so many ways. We are in a church building right now. Look around you, look at the walls. This building is composed of drywall, of uh, two by four wood, there's cement under this, there's dirt, there's some electrical and plumbing around us. Am I leaving anything out? There's carpet, some wiring, venting. There's a sewer line running over here that freezes in a bad year. If we're good, we're watching it now, it doesn't freeze. But you know that most of the week this is just uh, sitting here and there's a deep, dark coldness at night. If you ever visit at midnight, you don't want to do that. Sometimes churches feel scary at night, you know, the creaks and the groans and the sounds. But when you guys enter the parking lot, walk into this building on a Sunday morning or at a precepts Bible study, you know this building just comes alive. It's, it's, it feels completely different with you here, right? I have a lady who cleans <laughs> for the church and looks after the building. It feels different when you're here, right? All by yourself, right? I, I've heard people say that. But when you're all here, it's a completely different place. You transform this place just by walking into it. And we love being here and we have good feelings about the building. 
but it's just an empty shell without you. And it's a lot like your bodies. Without God, your life is an empty shell. It was meant to have the Holy Spirit dwelling in it, to bring it alive, to make it more, to make it mean something greater than just the sum of its parts, to serve something that is way beyond what you could ever dream. This is now, this building, holy ground. The property here is holy ground. Even at the gate, there are angels that surround this property. Some have seen them already. And what I love about it is how the unsaved feel about this place. I can always tell when it's holy because those who don't love the Lord find it difficult to walk through the doors, to even enter onto the property. They feel like they've just stepped out of one world and they're stepping into another and they start sweating bullets. What? Oh my goodness, what's going to happen to me now? They get ready to resist the pull of God on their lives. They can sense it. They may not be able to tell you why or what it all is, but they know it's there. I know what it's like because I once was not a Christian. And I knew what, how much I dreaded of being around especially evangelical Christians, because I didn't want to give in. I didn't want to give up my life. And I knew why I didn't want to give my life to God, because I just knew he'd make me a missionary and move me to Africa. And I just didn't want to do it. But you don't know what God wants for you. But you were made for it. I don't care who you are or what your past is, you were made for God to dwell inside of you. And you do not know the full purpose and the meaning of your life until that comes. But when he who are born again, when he moves into your life, when he enters your spirit, he also enters your body, and everything changes. You, by your faith and devotion, have made this wood and this dirt and these drywall into a holy place, a place of God's dwelling covenant. And this is what's happening in our lives, in our bodies. Something supernatural, beyond our understanding. The more you surrender your body to the King Jesus and into the service of his kingdom, the more you will discover what your body was made for in the first place. Yet this is but a taste of what is to come. We are going to receive so much more than that. And that's a lot right there. We are just getting a taste of what is around the corner. Because one day, the Lord Jesus Christ will appear in the sky with his angels and his hosts. And it says in the scriptures that he will return with those who have died before, like my mother, like my grandfather, like my great-grandparents, And many others, like my sister-in-law and many others, my best friend Dan, they will all come with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I bet you could name a few that will come with the Lord Jesus in the sky. And then those of us who are left, if the Lord were to return today, will be caught up too. And when we see him, we will be transformed, the scripture says, in the twinkling of an eye. That fast, it's not a 60-day program, it's not anything like that, in a twinkling of an eye. We will see him and we will be like him. And our bodies will be transformed. So I appreciate how fit Nathan Welsh is. But as fit as he is, he's not my goal. Or Dave Proctor. My goal is Jesus Christ. To receive a transformed and glorified heavenly body like Jesus. That will never die and never grow old. And that my body will begin to match my true age. Do you ever feel that way, that your bodies don't really reflect who you really are? On that day, it will show all the glory of God that is within you, and the transformation will be finished. I might fall asleep and die before that day comes. I might not see that day when the Lord returns like good friends and family members of mine have. But even death won't stop me. For my body will be raised and will be transformed. You will recognize me in heaven. I'll have the same good looks I have today. I'll just be healthier, stronger, 
maybe a bit younger. <laughs> the aging will be a thing of the past. I don't know how good looking I will be, but I'm sure it'll be just as good looking as you all. For lo the Lord loves beauty and creation. And my body will reflect what I've already become on the inside through Jesus Christ. I will be like him. I will fully know him, even as I am fully known. And this is a guarantee to all those who receive him now. Do you want to know more about that? Is that something you want in your life? Is that what you've been chasing and this world is not enough? Does this world, after all you can possibly eat and consume, leave you just feeling empty and unsatisfied? Have you tried every exercise and diet program that comes along in the latest fad? But if you would be born again and let Jesus dwell in your body as the temple of God, things can change dramatically for you. You become sanctified, set aside for God's use, dedicated into God's kingdom, and you can start following the Holy Spirit into obedience. You'll be amazed at what God can do even with your body, in the state it's in right now. He has created it for this purpose, to reveal his glory. Now hang on to this idea. This world, as soon as you leave this place, will try to convince you that I'm wrong. But this is from the word of God. It goes this way. You are not your body. You are a soul with a choice to make. You are not a slave to your body. And if you would choose Jesus Christ today, you could be set free from its demands. The choice is to take charge of ordinary flesh and blood and dedicate it to the service of Almighty God through the power of the Holy Spirit. You are not a body, but you are a soul who has a body. You can make that choice right now. And it will outlast and transform you into something that your old friends will not recognize or understand. If you would not just surrender your soul and your spirit, but your body too, in service to Jesus Christ. Paul said in this passage, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. All you have to do is surrender it. Stop transporting pigs with your body. Start treating it for the luxury model it is in the service of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Would you stand with me? I want to close in a prayer. Lord, we're here today because we love you so much. We have experienced, many of us, forgiveness. We thank you for what you have done in our hearts but Lord, this last battle that Paul talked about in Romans 7, this eternal battle with our bodies as it has its desires and its weaknesses, and as every day we find new struggles with it, Lord, we just need your help to get in control of this thing gets out of control in this world. We pray, O oh God, that as we have surrendered our thoughts and our minds to you, that we also now, Everyone who agrees in this prayer, we surrender our bodies to you as well. We'd ask you to take charge and authority, that you would teach us to be disciplined and to become in charge of what you have given us for your glory. Lord, today we dedicate these bodies, no matter in what shape they are, beaten down, broken, halfway working, whatever it might be, Lord, we dedicate them to you. And we say, oh Lord, that it is for you and for your transport, it is for your Holy Spirit to dwell in and not for anything else. And as we dedicate it to you, Lord, we pray that we would chase every unholy covenant we have made out and that we might keep it clean and in service for the king, that he would not be ashamed or embarrassed by the state that we're in. Because, Lord, anything dedicated to you, whether it's boards and drywall and wood or cement, or these bodies we're walking around in. It is a holy thing because of you. We thank you, Lord, for the joy and for the service we can give into your kingdom 
and for those who give all into your service. Lord, we pray as we leave this place that you would fill our hearts with encouragement, with strength that we did not know before that will go beyond the limits of what we thought was possible. We pray this in your holy name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you all. And uh, have a wonderful, blessed day. Amen. Come escape the city. Come to God's country. Come to God's people. Come to God's Word. Welcome to Millerville Community Church. We're just a short drive away.